So, uh, welcome to the new style theatre. No one's, I don't think, said that yet, have they? But this is a, a new development for IC this year, and it's a big improvement, I think, really, on the, on the other theatres they had. And it um, means that we can now get to where we're going to be quicker, and it's a, it's a tailor-made environment for everybody. I'm trying not to show my back to you down there, actually, so it's, you can see everybody OK. No one's actually cut off. Um, right. What? He's, he's trouble, this man, you know. We're going to have trouble from him on the panel. I can see it. There you go. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, we're now going to tackle probably one of the sexiest subjects that uh, we, can, we can tackle in AV uh, because so much has been talked about it, but nothing practically has been offered about how we can use new, new, new technologies in AV. So we're going to try and get to the bottom of some of these issues with some of the people really at the sharp end of deploying them. And um, I'm not, not sure which end I'll start at, really. I'll start with no favoritism at all. I'll start from my left. Introduce everybody. Um, to my left, it's um, Evan Grant, who's the founder of SEPA. You've probably seen some of his work around. There's Amelie Coleman, who is a futurist speaker and author. Um, there's Matthew Drinkwater, uh, who is the head of fashion innovation, the head of the fashion innovation agency at the London College of Fashion, which is a great title, isn't it? Amazing. Uh, but probably perhaps one of the best titles of all is um, San Shirati at the end there, who is a digital atelier and founder yeah. of Tiger Heart, <laughs> which has got to be a great job title, I have to say. But I mean, they, they seem to be getting better by the week, really, but there we are. <laughs> um, so technology, we're finding, you know, in the old days, they're terribly expensive. No one wanted to touch them. Unless they're integrated inside a box, no one wanted to have any kind of look or know how to deploy them. But... The, the time has changed, really. The, the technologies themselves are becoming more accessible and perhaps more affordable, although content's still incredibly expensive. But we are here with a group of people who are deploying this stuff and who can talk about how we can actually see how to approach some of this stuff um, in a way that's practical and um, deals with some of the challenges. Um, but where so many technologies, we're a bit awash with them. We've heard about augmented reality, VR, mixed reality and holography and everything else but we probably don't know what the hell they are and how to use them, where they're best deployed, and you know, how to evaluate them properly. So how are we going to do this? Are we going to start from the top rundown very briefly and just talk about where we are? We're probably with one of, one of, the, one of the technologies that perhaps we're seeing more of, which is augmented reality. We're seeing slightly more of a take up of, of that in AV, aren't we, for various reasons. Um, Evan, do you want to kick us off? Just. What is it basically and what is it? What is it? I mean, if it's useful. I mean I yeah, sometimes find it just confuses us more by knowing what it is actually. Sure. But anyway. I mean I imagine most people here probably know know what it is, but uh, I mean augmented reality initially started out as kind of dominantly mobile based, you know, kind of overlaying graphics on on uh, you know a camera feed of, of, of reality and now it's kind of evolved more into mixed reality with things like HoloLens and uh, Meta and different headsets. Um, and now you're getting sort of hybrids between the two, you know, so you're getting interactive store windows and fashion tryout things and all sorts of stuff. But I think it's really the kind of jargonistic terms. I think it's like any technology at the moment. A lot of people are just saying the words all the time because it's the new cool thing to do. Um, and there's not a lot of substance to it. Um, and I think it's the same as uh, any medium, really. You know, it's all going to be about storytelling and narrative and how you create compelling compelling experiences, really. So it's always about it. Amelia, what do you think? Is it storytelling and narrative? Um, well, what I'm really excited about when it comes to AR is web AR. So this is kind of the biggest trend I've seen so far in 2019. And it gets away from having to download anything um, to have an AR experience, which has always created friction in when it comes to things like retail and stuff. So to simply be able to point your camera at something and then have the augmented experience um, is really cool. And to me, I think why this could be a game changer is because it completely disrupts the customer journey. Um, for years, I've been working with retailers who've tried to bring together the physical and the digital and e-commerce with the bricks and mortars. And this is actually kind of a solution to that because you can create things like scavenger hunts in stores. So you get people the motivation to go around and to interact with the products. And then maybe they collect three of them and they become um, a coupon or you get something free. And all of a sudden, you're having this experience that you can share on 
social media. You can also share it with the people around you. Um, but then what's really, really clever, and why I think this is going to be gold and last for a long time, is because then you can integrate it with payment systems, because we're already paying with our mobile phone. Um, so we're able to pay with like WeChat, with Apple Pay, and then you have a seamless customer journey through the mobile, and this can be in store. Um, so I think that's the thing that excites me the most at the moment. How easy it, is it to, de to develop apps that, that use this? I mean, it, that sounds very compelling, obviously, and it's this very personal service that you, you need to make the, the customer experience more personal, don't need to engage them with what they're buying. But how easy it to de is it to develop apps and, and who is going to be doing that? Yeah, so the company I work with um, called Anition, they're doing a lot of web AR um, and a lot of these web AR scavenger hunts. And, um, and you know, augmented reality is something that people have been developing on for a long time. So it's just now, it's just this front end has become that much more accessible and that much easier for people to interact with. That bit at the end where you integrate into the payment systems, that's where we're still innovating. It does work, it's been proven to work, but I haven't actually probably seen it in action yet. Um, so I think that's coming this year though. There's some quite uh, interesting stuff happening around uh, certain platforms, for example, we've been working with Snapchat uh, quite a lot on AR with a project for Lego, and um, their thing is less about getting people into stores, it's more about trying to bring you the store into your living room. Um, and it's quite interesting with Snapchat, they've uh, surprisingly put a lot of effort into making it very, very simple to develop, um, and to, again, to get that link through to the sales. So uh, there's a project that we've been doing where um, you literally can Imagine if I loaded up my phone now, um, I can kind of walk around this space and walk into a Lego store and buy products in it and it sends me through to a basket and so on and so on. And I think you're going to see more and more of that kind of stuff, but I, I agree, web AR is definitely uh, very interesting, but at the moment there's still a bit of a barrier to entry with the development, I think. Which, I mean, Matthew, I mean, you know, from a fashion point of view, I mean, it seems to be a theme here, developing more retail than anything else, it was, you know, it's demanding new applications. Yeah, it is, and I, in some ways it's for, for us at London College of Fashion, it's how do we build that pathway towards those sorts of experiences, and then, you know, what opportunities could exist even beyond that. Um, and, and for us at the college, it's, it's trying to change the mindset of a student body that exists with us today, and also the retailers who are in market at the moment. And Developing a pathway for 3D is hugely important in developing these sorts of experiences. Um, the industry is not particularly well trained in using 3D as a design tool. Um, and so we have started a lot of work beginning to show to the fashion industry that creating in 3D will eventually enable them to create these assets a lot more simply. And then when you do that, you can begin to imagine what sort of experiences those could be for consumers and whether that's 3D assets on a, on a website and how consumers interact with it or whether that's through a headset and experiencing something through augmented or mixed reality. And you know, the, Amelia described lots of really interesting applications for where that's being shown right now with retail, but I think uh, Really, for us, the, the, the potential for augmented and mixed is to go even beyond that vision. I think you can imagine an entirely new computing platform. For us, where our work sits around how we help designers make their collections, show their collections, sell their collections, you could see an ability to create in virtual, in mixed, collaborate. London Fashion Week can be an entirely different experience. Um, we were very fortunate last year to spend, well, a number of years working with Lucasfilm and their immersive entertainment division, ILMX Lab, to develop a new vision for the industry where we, we kind of believe that within a decade, mixed reality glasses will be consumer facing. And at that point, when you can add digital content to the real world, what new business models does that offer, particularly for our industry, but, you know, probably for everyone in this room, there are really big opportunities ahead. I mean, Sanj, it's interesting. I mean, at, at this level, you know, with, with creators and students and stuff, thinking differently, I suppose they're always exploring new ideas. But we've uh, always thought these things are agency ideas, haven't yeah, we? I mean, and, you know, how do we get out of that? No, totally. And it, it, it's a really important question to, uh, well, discussion to have now, because when I started working with AR, which was like back in 2012, the algorithms and the hardware wasn't there. So the smart devices you were using 
didn't really have the computing power that you needed to have an AR experience. And the, uh, the, the algorithms, the compression algorithms that were utilizing the power of the device weren't there. So we had to build them. We had to build these algorithms to get the most out of the device. Now, you know, seven years later, the everyone's got a device that's very powerful. The, the way um, AR is embedded into the device you already have is, is, is a lot more seamless. It's not perfect, but it's in a better place. And it allows you now to be more creative and artistic with the platform more than ever. And that's the beauty, that, I mean, that's the real reason people want to mess around with AR is because it's an artistic platform. It's a new way of expressing yourself. Yeah, is that why it's taken off more than say virtual reality has? It's not quite as tactile, accessible. Well, it, it, they're two different platforms. So VR is great, AR is great. VR and AR are two different things. People tr always try and put them up against each other. What's better, AR or VR? And the reality is they're both great in their own you know, ways. They're just very different platforms. Um, and you know, each one has their, uh, you know, their great things. Uh, we're, we're working with a company based in Sydney that's developed smart fabrics that you put on and it measures your body mass and you can, you can purchase bespoke clothing through that platform. Mm -hmm. And the problem they have is this thing that they've created is this really ugly suit. So we've chopped this suit up and made little products, so like gloves, socks, trousers, things like that, um, that can measure your um, body mass. But then from that, you transpose um, AR onto that, and you can see bespoke shoes ha being created in real time through the AR space. Um, and again, it's not perfect, but we're starting to see uh, a new frontier of artistic expression, which is exciting. And I think Sanj is right about the power of devices because, you know, from all of those kind of mocap suits that are being used to capture data, depth sensing, facial tracking from mobile devices is so good that the ability to create a, an avatar that, you know, is 99% accurate of the human body within a matter of seconds is right at our fingertips. And for, for my industry, that offers a huge range of opportunities and everybody is going to have those devices. So yeah, that, that, that next step is super interesting. To it us. depends how all this is, is packaged, isn't it? Because you know, traditionally, with the, the, I've always thought there's been a, a bit of a disconnect in between the basic skills involved in, say, fashion, to pick this as an example, and technology, which you know, uh, seems to be a different discipline and so on. It's where these things are actually merging. Are they merging in the creative environment you've got at London Fashion, uh, yeah, London School um, of Fashion, or is it, I mean, so it seems to be a big leap for people coming in, learning how to design and so on, then start to have to think into 3D. It happened with Peter, didn't he, on Lord of the Rings, he, he started had to, never having done it before, he started to film in 3D, and they were, they were doing storyboarding in 3D, how the hell they did I don't know, but, you know, for, for younger graduates and students coming through, you know, how on earth, how is it introduced to them? How do, how do you develop it through, essentially? Yeah, when I, when I look back six years ago, there was an enormous gap between that skill set. That's come a lot closer, but we have to, we have to work really collaborati collaboratively with the technology industry. I mean, there's software for 3D design that's been around for a long time and continues to get better. But as you look at emerging technologies, we, it's really impossible for us to have complete ownership over augmented virtual mix, cryptocurrencies, blockchain, artificial intelligence, how all of those are going to have an impact on our industry. We need access to technology and we need to start working externally with partners. So we've just finished a year working alongside Microsoft, um, where Microsoft amazingly opened their doors to allow us to work with artificial intelligence, mixed reality and wearable computing, and we'll do another round of that this year, and it, it, it will remain a vital component of how we educate a new generation in, in the creative industries with direct access to technology, working closely with creative technologists um, to, to build a new future for the industry. But it, it's not something that we can do by ourselves. I think there is recognition that it, it has to be done in partnership. I mean, we're, we, are, we are in an age of collaboration. That's the age we're in at the moment. There's there's this kind of mindset that we ha that someone has to learn about this technology very quickly. And the reality is I think you just need to find someone that's skilled in that area and work with them to come up with something exciting. But where, where do these people live? I mean, yeah, where is this collaboration happening? All over the place. 
Yeah. We've got anyone here? I was going to say who's in the audience, actually. I mean, I'd nice to know what sort of audience is, is looking you? intently from us. I see not one of you is looking down at your mobile phone, so they're obviously <laughs> doing something right. Have we got any coders here? Anyone that builds? In like, yeah, there we go. Oh, that's interesting. Where are you from? Mexico. Mexico. Do you code in Mexico? OK. There's a, lot, there's a lot happening with I'll give you my card. The, uh, open source <laughs> community. Uh, no, it's, it's great. I mean, the, 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 these, um, these skilled people are very hard to find. Yeah. Um, there was a, when I was at Halitian, there was this lady that uh, Jonathan and I, we found. She was studying at um, a university in Spain called Maria. She's now at Snapchat now. She writes a lot of the face tracking code. Um, and we had, to, we had to find her. I know it sounds a bit dodgy going around the world looking for Spanish ladies to <laughs> create content, but... Just goes to Spain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it, people like yourself are very hard to find, and we, you yeah. know, we need to find more of them. You were saying about the open source community. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we find the open source community <coughs> is probably the best place to, to find interesting people, because uh, I, I personally believe the people who do the best work start with a passion. Yeah. Um, and the open source community is a kind of perfect example of that, really, you know, where people are willing to give away their work and contribute to other people's work for a shared goal. Yeah. Um, and so most of our team over the last 20 years has been vested very much in that community. And yeah, long may it live on as opposed to proprietary platforms. How do you? I was going to say, what, what really interests me, too, is taking um, different technologies and sticking them together and having that kind of collaboration. Um, you know, I think you know, all headsets will include machine learning and AI within the next couple of years. I think uh, HoloLens 2, there's rumor it's going to debut at Mobile World Congress next month. And that is one of, a head, one of the headsets that's embedded with machine learning and AI. And what this means is that it starts to um, learn your preferences, um, you know, personalize experiences, and then also be able to communicate with you. So we could get to a point where our headsets are actually saying, I'm going to turn off now because you need to go and eat. You need to go outside and get some real fresh air. Um, so I think that's kind of neat. When we start to look at how we can bring new technologies together, um, another one is going back to biodata and, um, and looking at how we can create generative virtual reality experiences based on things like biodata and then taking it a step further and using brain waves to do the same. It's funny, so we've, we've, we've hit a period of development where, you know, in the old days, the vendors or people who manufactured the technologies did something in private that get, then introduced us to it. And then we'll eat it live the flower, it won't, and we'll see how the early doctors use it and, and pass it on and see how it develops. Now it seems it's been turned the other way around. That actually, the user community is beginning to use things more intelligently, or if that's, that's probably not the right word to use, you know, doing what they're doing to help to, to try stuff because it's now available in an in a easier to use way mm -hmm. to try new things and start to work out. And they say, have you tried that? That's where potentially collaborations coming on. I mean, in a way, it's almost like a new era appearing in a Absolutely. sense, isn't it? You know, I think, I think almost user-driven rather than manufacturer-driven. Absolutely. I, I think there is a problem, though, with, with new ideas that there's, there's this kind of space race between different companies, different uh, you know, businesses who are, who are trying to be the first at doing something, trying to, you know, they, they, they invest all of their time and resources in something and they, they promise the future to the consumers and then it doesn't work out and then that, that type of technology yeah. has a has been labelled with like a sort of you know a tarnished brush for a while. Um, you know, prime example Google Glass. You know, it, it, there was lots of hype behind it, and then mm. it, te it technically failed, even though it was a fantastic piece of engineering. Um, that I think that for some reason there's this this problem where people are just trying to push things a bit too far down people's throat before the user get to engage with it. Are we though entering a period where we can have throwaway technology, you know, and say, well, you know, we're trying this, it may not work, if it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You know, so I, I know we're referring to these things, as you said, with artificial, uh, artificial intelligence which has been hyped to the rafters, really. Mm. What we're using isn't really AI, but, you know, elements, or we just done a big article on it, you, mm. you know, so, mm. you know, it, it, these names are being banded around, where we, should, we should actually pay more attention to what people are actually doing, you know, and, yeah. I think and learning from that, calling it something else, perhaps. Yeah, I think sometimes as well, it's just too early. Yeah. You know, you, you, the, the kind of, uh, for society and culture to kind of catch up with something often takes a lot longer than the technology itself. Um, and you tend to find the people who often will be successful from a corporate side are the ones who sit and watch the early startups, learn from their failures, and then swipe in, you know, it's the sort of Apple model. Yeah. Um, but I, th I think the, the, the thing that, 
threatens the collaboration a little bit and, and uh, some of the open source stuff that I'm passionate about is as everything moves very much to machine learning and AI, we're going to get to a point where there's really going to be probably less than a handful of major AIs in the world. You know, the likes of Google, Microsoft, so on and so on, um, Amazon, Apple, uh, you know, pumping money and trying as much as they can to obviously, you know, garner data. You know, I mean, the uh, Amazon with Alexa and the fact that they basically pretty much give away the hardware is because actually what they're trying to do is consume as much data about humanity and voice and everything else to train their AI. And I think moving forwards to be competitive with creative projects and creative output, you're going to have to use their AIs. Um, and they're going to become even greater gatekeepers. And I think that's a little bit worrying to me. There's always a dark side about technology, isn't there, really? And it's, yeah. it's always the dark side we focus in on first rather than the positive benefits of us doing actually trying out new things that um, are just challenge, challenging what we do. And that's what AV really, I'm hoping, is going to go into that sort of realm of of doing things differently and, and then helping us think, if we're, if we're doing things differently, it'll then help us to decide what the technology the next step on are going to be like and hopefully start to develop them really. It's, it's all, this is all a preliminary process of us trying new stuff out, isn't it, in a absolutely. sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's also a, a question around research and development budgets, particularly coming from a fashion background. Fashion brands don't have no. research and development budgets. Um, you know, are you look any of those big technology companies, their R&D budgets will be bigger than the turnover of almost every major high street retailer. So we become utterly reliant on engaging with those brands. So I, I would agree with Evan. I think there is a question of where that power and where, from a fashion perspective, what, what even future retailers will, will look like and where they'll be coming from. I suspect they'll be coming from very unexpected, unusual areas. But future retail and, and live events who are actually really engaging because yeah. it's big money to be made. I suppose yeah. where there's immense amount of activity and, and life and vibrancy is well, where you find... Didn't, didn't Fortnite just host one of the world's biggest yeah. concerts? Um, just the weekend. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I think it's interesting as well, go, um, <coughs> going back to something that was mentioned earlier about you know, the fact that VR, AR, MR, they're very separate platforms. But one of the things that we're finding quite interesting that's creating sort of almost like two camps, AR versus VR, is VR is very isolating. Um, and especially in the attractions world, one of the big things that comes up is that, you know, if you go, for example, to a theme park or even a shared shopping experience, you don't want to be isolated. Actually, you want to share that with the people you're with. And so, um, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of prototyping at the moment in terms of using mixed reality on ride systems, for example. Because, you know, one of the things that's really expensive, if you want to you know, make this building look like Harry Potter world, that costs a fortune. But to do that in software, it's a lot cheaper, you know. And that, so I think there's, there's some interesting directions there. But yeah, they're, they're, they're running in parallel, but they, they often get blurred. We tend to get confused between why we call the informational and the experiential. You know, experiential, you want a wow experience, don't you? But information, you just want stuff delivered to you, perhaps in a, in a simpler way, but more intuitively. And that's a different, presumably, experience to the one where you, you, you're wafting out like Harry playing a game, whatever it is they play, in the middle of whatever it is they play, you know. Mm. And I think that sometimes people get confused with the more glamorous side of that and forget the really necessary, ba much more basic stuff that actually requires this sort of technology to really innovate it sufficiently. I guess, I guess the question is, would you prefer to digest information in a kind of fun, gamic way? Because I think that's certainly, you know, the first company that nails some stylish sunglasses, you know, in collaboration with Ray-Ban that have AR in them that can tell you about your world, you know, that, that will start that next chapter. And it's most li it'll most likely be Apple, in my opinion, because they've been very quiet on that. But, but then it, th this question does come up, you know, rather than reading through perhaps some boring information you've got to process for your work, if you could gamify that somehow or integrate it into the world around you, would you prefer to do that? I, I think I would. I know I would. I'd love to. I think we'd both like to deliver a magazine that just, when people get it, suddenly they can experience what we're writing about by plugging into what the magazine presents in a different type of... I mean, I don't think we're anywhere near that, fortunately. But um, just imagine <laughs> you picked up something that you, you were reading and then you'd suddenly... Be, be jump, you'd be able to jump into it and experience what we were writing about and you could see it. 
you know, I'd love to do something like a, that. That's a billion dollar piece of tech IP that I think you yeah. should yeah. Yeah. Yes. get, get I think signed so. up very quickly. Frightened the living death out of my publisher if I suggest <laughs> anything like that. <laughs> we'll all come and more pitch staff it. would be more a priority. <laughs> Sorry. We'll all come and pitch it with you. Well, I'm with <laughs> yeah, thanks. That, well, that'd, that'd be great, actually. Middle of Croydon would be wonderful. <laughs> um, voice actor, we've got, vo we've got a lot of stuff here. I mean, a holography. I mean, is it worth going to this? I mean, you know, volu projecting volumetric images, I suppose people think, oh, well, posh projection, you know, doddle. You know, but, you know, how, how far can we go with existing... T I mean, projection's doing amazing things. We've got 3D mapping everywhere. We've got amazing screens that people are pumping right, left and centre. I mean, you know, IC tends to be a bit of a screen explosion, doesn't it, really? I mean, you go into Hall 12 and it's, you know, it's, it's there. And unfortunately, you never see that... The, um, the development of audio that should be going with it that adds to that experience and really blows you away, which you should be doing, really. Audio almost is invisible here if you go into separate halls. They're very much a part of it. I've always thought the way we demonstrate technology should be all together in a way that they seem to complement each other. And that's how we should develop stuff, so that when all these come together, that's what fuses new ideas coming out, isn't it? So, well, that, our environment works like that, and that's how we should be thinking more about it. But I mean, in terms of existing stuff like projection, I mean, are we are we looking at more advancements being made that that where you, it can do really amazing stuff? Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, holography, as you know, as a AV term, has been around for a while. It's very old as, as, yeah. a, as a thing, isn't it? 1862. It's like, exactly. 1862. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's great. Um, every time I get a client asking me for that type of platform. Their assumption is that it's like the Star Wars R2-D2 thing, which at the moment is impossible, but that, that will change. The key thing for it to be successful is the narrative. The story has to engage with the consumer in the right way. Um, and there's lots of things that can be done. So there's a project we're working on at the moment with a really amazing artist called Sarah Pope. She paints lips, They're these really beautiful lips. Check her out, she's really cool. And what we're doing with her is we're creating a hologram of those lips. Because she's an artist, she wants to do that. And we're fusing AI into it so you can talk to these lips. So the idea, and we haven't built it yet, but we're designing it at the moment. The experience is you'll walk into this room, be a dark room, you'll sit down, and these really sexy lips will appear, and she'll start asking you questions. And we're trying to pitch um, uh, Scarlett Johansson for the voice at the moment, but right. we'll see what happens because their ag agent's just not uh, returning our calls. But... You're, yeah, is that, is that you can do that. So the idea is to create an emotive experience where the user engages with, with these lips. Yeah. Now, they could engage with the lips because they find them sexy. They could engage with the lips because they find them interesting. They could engage with them because they hate them and they want to destroy them. But we're just what we want to do is create an experience where we're fusing tech together and create an experience that engages. Um, and the idea came from Peppa Pig originally because... Um, one of my friend's daughters, she loves Peppa Pig, and she's uh, messing around with this app where she gets to talk to Peppa Pig using AI. And she sits there for hours just talking to Peppa Pig. And that is a fantastic bit of engagement right there that needs to be, tra I think, needs to be transposed into other forms of AV. And so we're, tr we're gonna try it out with holographics this year. That's the plan. I think the, tr the tricky thing with um Holograms as well is it's it's a completely misused term. I imagine yeah. you're talking about yeah, Pepper's yeah, Ghost, no, exactly. right? Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. Pepper's Ghost isn't a hologram. Um, there's only there's an illusion, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's two or three projects that are in their infancy at the moment that are, could actually be classed as holography. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we, we get it all the time. People ringing up and going, "I want a hologram," but people don't actually really know what they're asking for. <laughs> you know, it's somewhere between a, a transparent display and a Pepper's Ghost, but. But I, I do think that's uh, a big breakthrough uh, technology that's, that will dominate when someone cracks it because ultimately it's the way that you can start to bring human storytelling into environments, right? So, you know, one of the big challenges we have is uh, we're actually trying to do away with actors and people because they're expensive and they have welfare issues. <laughs> um, and ultimately, if you can, you know, create a realistic human, um, you know, hologram, whatever you want to call it, um, that opens up huge, huge potential. And the same thing, go back to the AI, you know, one of the leading companies, British company that's been bought by uh, Google, DeepMind, um, you know, their entire goal is to create a sentient creature, a sentient bot that you can talk to that you wouldn't know um, is an AI. 
put those two technologies together, um, and yeah, I think I think that's the way the future is going. For the God, yeah. Amelia, we're, we're very close. Yeah. Like the, yeah. that, that AI yeah. and that visualization, we're very close. It I reckon. It takes you about yeah, like with a point. normal bot, it takes about ten minutes now, I'd say, before yeah. you can tell they're not real. Like Boy. I think the, um, the development of digital humans and Clive, you mentioned voice. Yes. That that interaction between you know something that is not a real person, but you're interacting. Everyone in marketing is obsessed with voice te technology and what that will do. Actually, that's quite an unnatural interaction. I find that a weird way to come home and talk to Alexa. But if, <laughs> if Alexa looked like a real person, if my Blade Runner 2049 vision of having a digital girlfriend comes real, God, you've got a house sad <laughs> of mine. <laughs> but, but that evolution of digital humans is, you know, here there's some amazing work being done from Magic Leap to um, some other really fun studios in the US that those sort of interactions and what they'll do for my industry and I guess everyone else's is really powerful. So we're super interested in that technology. Well, it's kind of a race, isn't it, between like the robotics and the kind of holography type technology and then also the games and the VR and everyone ultimately is just trying to recreate. It's like Frankenstein, right? We're just yeah. trying to recreate ourselves basically in, well, in whatever medium. Yeah, what I think is going to have uh, the biggest impact on all these things we're talking about is 5G. Um, so we saw the introduction of this with uh, the Winter Olympics at the beginning of last year where Intel introduced it over in Asia and we're seeing it kind of being adopted in the east and it's coming west. I think, you know, over in the west we have a lot of infrastructures and big business in place that is actually, um, you know, has a vested interest in us not getting 5G. So it's going to be a bit slower. But what it means is it means that all this data that we're creating all the time can start to correlate in real time. So things like autonomous vehicles, you know, my car is learning from the environment, learning from me, learning from the car in front of me. The car behind me is learning from this car. Um, and all this data that we're producing um, helps to surge that. And when it comes to things like the new realities, what this means is that when we do things like hollow portation, which is, um, you know, through the HoloLens where I'm filmed as a 360 degree 3D hologram and can be, you know, hollow ported. It's a real kind of beam me up Scotty moment, um, you know, to another country to have a meeting face to face with somebody else. At the moment, there's a tad of latency and it's still a bit pixelated and everybody needs really good, strong internet connections and nobody else can be on the internet at that time. It's like the old days of when we were, you know, dialing up and that kind of thing. But with 5G, it's going to enable it to, um, to cut the latency, to increase the quality, and all of a sudden these experiences become better for the user, and I think that's going to have um, a great influence on adoption. Massive. I don't think people know it's quite coming, do they? <laughs> there'll, pour, there'll be a point on every street where there'll just be massive uh, download and, and instant streaming, won't there? Um, it'll wipe the cable companies out, probably, won't it? It'll be a new, new if, type if of model. If it works. If it works. I, I think you probably will do, because it's got to work, I think, really. It to, We've yeah. reached that point where it, somebody's got to give, because the quality of what we're receiving is not good enough Absolutely. for us to want to do I what mean, we're doing. I um, mean, 4, 4G is so bad in the UK that BT mm. offer free Wi-Fi with their 4G deals. Yeah. So, but hey. But where can we, where can we see, I mean, we talked about, <coughs> you know, people using t technology creatively and so on. We talked about you know what's potentially open in the public domain and what companies are perhaps doing in private. Where can we where can we plug in to find out and see what people are doing and to give everybody here a bit of a an inkling about what they should be keeping an eye on over the next six to, six to twelve months. You'd tell me off if I said what I was going to say. <laughs> Go on. There's, a, com there's a competing so. magazine that begins with a W, which is a good place to start. <laughs> Wired? Yeah. Oh, thanks yeah. very much. <laughs> <That's a compliment>. <laughs> <coughs> I subscribe, by the way. Is it, but, uh, uh, yeah, oh, I mean, there's loads of stuff like that. But I mean, yeah. obviously, dig around online. But okay. um, I find there's a, I find Wired's quite a nice you oh, know, mash, okay. mash up. And obviously, uh, AV magazine. Well, we're trying to. Yeah. We're being pulled in all directions at the moment. Yeah, but... Um, yeah, it's difficult to know where to, to actually see something actually happening, you know. But, but I, w I would no say the most exciting for it, really. thing happens is when people come together and start having those conversations. All of the projects that we've led have come from conversations where we've been out looking and just start building and making. Just, 
I, I would imagine there's lots of people in here who have the opportunity to start building something. And that, that genuinely, they have a platform in AV Magazine to begin to showcase what they're doing. Everyone here could do some stuff. And that, for me, that's where all of the good stuff is coming. Mm. A, lot, a lot of the uh, technology platforms as well now are way less kind of coder orientated. Yeah. You know, anyone with basic computing skills can, for example, pick, pick up, the, I was talking about the Snapchat, uh, AR, you know, I mean, you can literally create an app with virtually no technical knowledge within five minutes on there. And there's a lot of similar platforms depending on the context you're looking at. And so I think the idea of rapid prototyping from less technical people is already here, you know. And I think that, you know, if you're, if you're looking for inspiration, you're looking to see what's possible, I mean, I guess it's kind of obvious, but YouTube and Vimeo are just full of anyone who's experimenting with any of this stuff. You know, the way that's shared is by just sticking the videos online, right? Mm. Um, I offer a free service. I do a monthly um, innovation newsletter called The Big Reveal. You can subscribe on my website, um, ameliacolman.com. There's a shameless plug for you. And, um, and then there's also a bunch of innovation studios. Um, I run one in London um, called the Initian Demo Studio. And that's a place where people can come and get hands on with the technologies and, uh, and start to experiment. And um, and have ideas and see inspiration and get involved. Basically, we've got one of those as well. Actually, if we're doing company plugs, yeah, <laughs> we have a sensational demo lab really. as well. Okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure you've got a tiger have, one as well, right? This is why we unfortunately <laughs> have these these well, I, I would colleagues say, on our um, panel today. Look, really, look, look for your local accelerator because there's there's when yeah. I, when I started in the tech space, there was like three accelerators in the world. There was uh, Palo Alto, London. Tel Aviv, they were like the key ones that I, I knew of. Now there's like loads of them in, in every country, in every city, and there's opportunity. So if there isn't an accelerator in your town, go to your local you know, government and get them to fund it and run it and grow it and grow your community and start to mess around with technology and bring that to, you know, bring that to the table. Okay. Just from the, the floor, really, anybody working in these sort of areas that can give us a little bit of insight into what they're doing and what they've found? and. Yeah. Any kind of challenges they come across? Be useful to know. Watch your head. Can you just tell us who you Oh, yeah, it's the old <laughs> catch box, yeah. Hello. Well done. Yeah, um, so uh, you mentioned about uh, web AR, right? And that obviously, so uh, I'm in the field, I'm actually in the field of events and experiences, but we have a dedicated department which focuses on AR and VR solutions for experiential marketing. Uh, web AR is something which we've been wanting to really get in, get our, you know, Clause into and try to get it uh, operational for most of our events. How do we go about something like that? How, sorry, I didn't catch a lot. How do we what? How do we go about? I mean, what are the platforms for web web AR which uh, makes it much more accessible for? Uh, I mean, that's an area where we face a lot of challenges because nobody wants to download an app, and unfortunately, most AR experiences are based on downloading something or the other from an app store or a link sent pushed to the consumer. And when we're doing it for a short, small audience, it's, it's a little bit of a problem. So I, I, I think it depends on what you're building, what it is that you're trying to deliver through um, the, the, the web uh, platform. Because the problem you have is that everyone has a completely different computer with a different spec. Same with phones. I mean, phones, you're, you're either Android or, or you know, iOS, but then there's, there's all different forms of Android. And the problem you have is when you're building something for web, especially if it's AR, is that it has to work efficiently on all of those platforms. Um, and when I was at Helition, we struggled with that. So when we started writing face tracking software, lipstick trying algorithms, all of our clients wanted it to run on, uh, on browser, but we just couldn't build it because it was, you know, there was only a we only had five coders, and we had to build something that would work on everything. Now, I, I mean, I'm not at Helition anymore, but I found out about like six months ago, I think it was, or about nine months ago, they launched it on web browser. But it took them, it took them years to get to that level. I think the first thing is, what is it that you're trying to build? Is it going to exist on browser? Does it need to exist on browser? Because it could exist on something like Facebook. You know, everyone has Facebook on their phone, and the Facebook AR kit's pretty cool. I mean, it depends what you want to do. Um, and then once, once you define that, then, then build it and then take it, to, you know, take it to market. But ultimately, it depends on what it is that you're, you, know, you want to build. OK. Hello. Yeah, so it was more, I mean, as long as I can get some kind of uh, accurate image recognition or marker recognition, 
then I can build the rest of the content accordingly. So yeah, that, that's the main. I, I don't think people realize just how good smartphones are in this day and age. Like seriously, like the Apple uh, face tracking software on the on the iPhone X, you can put into a wall and it can track so much information, which means you can control, you know, AV, you can control doors, you can talk to it, you can blink at it, you can. There's so much you can do, but no one's actually done anything with it yet. And it's the same with the um, with the Google AR kits and and the Facebook AR kit as well. Um, it's worth taking a uh, it's worth taking a look at the Google machine learning API. Yeah, they've got an image recognition, a face recognition, a speech recognition. Um, yeah, they're really good and very easy to use. It's it's baffling now. It's absolutely baffling what you can do. It's it's down to the creatives to you know make it happen. Okay, anyone else? No, because Amanda's, Amelia's got to pop off, unfortunately, but no. So, are we okay? Can we get a Mexican wave? <laughs> Not that, that. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, right. maybe, okay. <laughs> so, Sanj, Matthew, Amelia, and Evan, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.